thank you all for uh, taking the time to be here uh, this morning. Um, today, we're going to talk about a little bit about fleas and ticks, some of their biology, uh, then some control tactics uh, as well. So we'll go ahead and jump in here. Um, again, just looking at you know the life cycles of, of certain species and then some treatment timings and recommendations that kind of make treatment maybe a little bit easier and also to try to hit some of those key timings um, when some of those pests are most active. Uh, objectives today, uh, flea and tick biology, some IPM for interior and exterior control of fleas and ticks, uh, working safe and smart. You know, we want to make sure that we're definitely safe out there and also doing um, things that are going to make our jobs a little bit easier and more efficient. Um, we'll be a little bit on some of our products for flea and tick. Uh, it's not a focus of this uh, talk, though, but uh, we will mention a couple. Um, but before we get started, one thing that um, you guys, if you've been on this uh, these talks before, you know we always do a little bit on safety because really being safe is the most important thing. Uh, we all want to get home at the end of the day. Uh, you know, we want to get home safely to our families, friends, and uh, there's really nothing else more important than that. So, really, today's is just very quickly on you know your vehicle. Um, you know, the idea is every day you should take a look at your vehicle before you start your day. Um, I know that's not always possible. Sometimes you forget, sometimes we're in a hurry, but, you know, make sure that you do, do this regularly. It can be once a day, once a week, um, but it's pretty important. So you want to check your mirrors first, um, especially if you're getting into different vehicles, maybe every other day or so, maybe there's a different service vehicle you're in and you're used to. Uh, it could be a rental vehicle, it could be a lot of different things, but check your mirrors. Um, and what I'll say on mirrors real quick, the side mirrors, um, one of the easiest things to do is when you sit in the vehicle, hands on the wheel, look to your mirrors. Um, you shouldn't see the side of your vehicle in that side view mirror. So it should be adjusted so you just can't see the side of your vehicle. What that does is really reduces your blind spots um, and allows you to have a clear view, you know, the side of the vehicle, eliminates uh, a blind spot back there. Um, so again, just line those mirrors up so you just are outside the view of your actual side of your car um, and that'll help you out. Rear view mirror, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Make sure it's in a position where you can see clearly out the back window. Um, again, that'll help eliminate some blind spots. Make sure your wipers are in good working order. Uh, with all this heat, uh, summertime, uh, those windshield wipers sit on the windshield and bake. Um, if they're hard and brittle, cracked, make sure you replace them because when you turn them on, if it does rain, you're going to have a big smear across the window and probably not going to be able to see very well. Uh, make sure all your lights are working. Uh, you could have someone stand uh, behind your vehicle, make sure your brake lights come on, make sure your, your signals come on, um, and then also uh, the headlights are working well. Check your tire pressure and tread. Uh, this is really important uh, just because uh, in, if it does rain, uh, that tread helps keep you on the road, helps keep, the, keep those contact patches of the tire on the road itself, um, and they want to be in good working order. Uh, so good tread, good pressure, and your tire pressure, uh, recommendations are really inside the driver's side door of your vehicle. You'll see a sticker there which tells you what the pressure of each tire needs to be. So that's a great place to look for it. Um, and then make sure any loose items in the vehicle or in the truck bed are, are secure. Uh, you don't want them bouncing out or flying out when you're driving. We all drive a lot. We all see stuff all over the road. And uh, those are things that typically fly out of vehicles. So make sure they're secure. So that's our, our safety share today. Uh, hopefully this uh, gets you to go out and take a look at your vehicle, uh, maybe before you get, get back in it after this talk. Um, so today we're going to talk about, you know, fleas and ticks. So um, fleas are going to be uh, first here. Um, and really the cat flea is, uh, is really the most important species. Um, you know, the, the cat there on the, on the left, that's one of mine. And that's probably how they feel if they get fleas on them. So um, you want to make sure that they're they're protected. And again, that primary species is the uh, is the cat flea. These guys are fairly small, you know, twelfth to a sixth of an inch in length. So you know, fairly small to see. Uh, dark brown. They are dorsally flattened. They do have very strong hind legs to allow them to jump very quickly and very far. Um, and so they can move away from you um, if you're trying to inspect for them. 
Uh, primary hosts are cats and dogs. Um, you'll see some of these highlighted, uh, uh, some of this highlighted text throughout the presentation. These are some clues for the quiz um, at the end. So, um, so again, primary hosts are cats and dogs, uh, so they will infest both. Um, they do get onto us as well and other animals. So, you know, whether it's a squirrel, a raccoon, a possum, uh, you know, deer, other things that are out in the environment, uh, they do uh, get onto those as well. Um, they do like uh, moist, warm environments, uh, relative humidity 75% or greater, and really temperatures between 65 and 90 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, these are all preferred habitats for uh, flea development. Uh, that's important, you know, when looking at you know, areas around the exterior of the home. So the general flea life cycle, um, you know, you've got your adult, uh, they feed on a host, uh, female gets a blood meal, uh, they lay eggs, those eggs hatch into a larva. Uh, there are several larval stages, uh, but four main stages overall. Um, they then pupate, so they form this pupa around their bodies, uh, then they turn into that adult flea. So really there are three instars um, with the larval uh, life stage, uh, two weeks to several months to maturity, and then they pupate inside these cocoons. Um, we'll talk about this some more later, but that cocoon stage is really not susceptible to a lot of treatments. So once they're in that stage, um, treatment may be a little less effective, but they can sit in that stage for a long time. Um, I would say up to six months to maybe even a year. They can just wait there for that host to show up. Um, so these guys, again, this is 20 weeks in the cocoon. So again, pre-emerged adults in those cocoons. Um, I would say maybe even longer in some circumstances. Um, they can complete that uh, anywhere from 14 to 90 days. So really that's important when you're looking at treatment. You may go into a place, you know, they have fleas and doors. Um, you do your treatment. Um, maybe a need to come back and usually is a need to come back and, you know, maybe 10 to 14 days later and do a follow-up treatment, um, you know, to get some of those ones that were in that stage that didn't come out. Uh, and then you vacuum, you cause vibrations on that floor surface, they'll pop out, uh, do a good treatment there, and you're good to go. Um, they can live up to several months without feeding. So I don't know if you've noticed, if you go into a, a structure that's had, you know, uh, fleas, and then say it's an apartment that folks moved out, uh, you go in before the new tenants come in, they want it treated, and they just attack you like crazy. So that might have been empty for a couple of months. Um, and then they're ready to feed at that point. So they just come out and just hit your ankles uh, like crazy. So adults, um, females can lay up to egg, eight eggs after every blood feeding. So four to 500 throughout their lifetime. So that's a lot of fleas. Um, and you figure, you know, if she's laying eight eggs every time, four to 500 throughout her lifetime, a lot of those are gonna be uh, females that are laying eggs as well. So the infestation can grow pretty pretty rapidly, uh, if not uh, controlled. Um, the adult stage is really one of the most susceptible life stages for, for any kind of chemical control. Again, they're on the surface there, they're, they're out, they're exposed. Um, so a lot more susceptible to those uh, adult aside treatments. Uh, the larva, um, eggs hatch one to 12 days, just depending on conditions. Um, they're, the eggs are very resistant to chemical control, as we've talked about um, with you know, even that cocoon, but even the eggs themselves. Um, I would say even eggs that have sat for a while are probably even more resistant uh, to chemical control. If they're fresh eggs, maybe a little bit more susceptible to some of those adulticides. So what do they look like? Um, these are flea eggs, so very, very small, very hard to detect um, you know, visually with your eyes. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're there, they're in cracks and crevices, they're in the carpets. Um, about a half a millimeter, uh, early white ovals. They are laid while the female is on the host. She'll just kind of lay those off the host onto a surface, uh, can lay them you know, on the host as well, and one to 10 days. Uh, and then they will hatch at 
below, won't hatch below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And once you get up to higher than 95 degrees, they don't do so well either. So uh, just some things to keep in mind. Larva, about two millimeters, uh, legless, white, kind of look like a worm. Uh, typically uh, one to two weeks is uh, their uh, maturity. They do search for food, including organic matter, skin, flea droppings, uh, containing undigested blood. So they're really down in the carpet or down in those cracks and crevices. That's where they're feeding on you know, this type of uh, organic debris that's there. Uh, we all shed skin. We all, you know, our pets do as well. So there's enough there usually to, uh, to feed them. Uh, development, they do like darker areas, uh, including furniture, carpets, uh, inside your, your pet houses. So if you have a place, um, you know, like one of those cat towers with those little enclosed areas for cats to get into, you know, dog houses, uh, they do develop outdoors as well. So they'll get under decking, uh, under trees and shrubs and leaf litter, things like that. They'll definitely uh, be able to develop there as well. So this uh, pupil stage, uh, about five millimeters long, it's a white, silken, uh, sticky cocoon. Um, metamorphosis occurs and they develop into the adult flea. It can be, again, one week to over six months. Uh, they're usually in well-protected areas. So again, any of those cracks and crevices uh, down in the carpet um, are, are good areas for them. Um, and environmental conditions can impact you know, their emergence. So you know, things like temperature, humidity, uh, and then vibrations can stimulate emergence. So that's why we talk about vacuuming. Uh, and again, if you've ever walked into a place that's maybe been empty for a month or so, they had a flea infestation, you walk in there. As soon as you walk in, those adults are emerging out of those cocoons, you know, jumping onto your ankles, um, and they're ready to feed at that point. So vacuuming is very, very important. It stimulates that emergence from those cocoons. And again, you know, they're, they're pretty smart. You know, they've been around a long time. Uh, they know that if they had to snatch out randomly, there's no host there, what's going to happen? They're probably not going to survive. So they've learned this to wait for that vibration, something walking by, something causing that, you know, movement of the surface. And then they're going to hatch out and say, hey, here's my meal. It came right to me. Adult stage, about two and a half millimeters. Uh, they are wingless, uh, laterally compressed, like we talked about, and they do take a blood meal. So these guys do, uh, you know, bite us. Uh, they do find hosts. They bite. They inject saliva, suck out the blood, uh, and then they can reduce many times and then uh, then die. So that's really what they do. Uh, they don't really care about much else. Uh, they're really there to uh, make more ticks, feed, uh, mate, and then move on. So uh, their saliva can transmit many diseases, including the plague, uh, typhus, uh, Um And, you know, they are considered a public health pest. So these guys, you know, can uh, cause some serious issues. Other health concerns, you know, flea bite, uh, anemia, which, you know, probably not a huge deal. Um, they can also cause itching and redness uh, at, the, uh, at the bite site and also uh, intestinal uh, worms. So a little bit about control of fleas. So, you know, pet bedding is a key. Um, you know, if there are pets in the house, make sure that bedding is taken, laundered, um, dried on, a, on high heat. Uh, typically, you know, a dryer, you know, if you get that heat up to, you know, 110 degrees, something like that, maybe a little bit higher, um, you can, can eliminate a lot of the issue. Um, vacuum all surfaces. This stimulates that emergence that we already talked about. Uh, we'll remove those uh, newly emerged uh, adults. Um, you may also even vacuum up some of the cocoons, larvae that are in there. Probably not a whole bunch uh, because they do stick pretty well to, to those fibers in the carpet, but it just helps emerge, get some of those uh, that population that's waiting to come out uh, out of that structure. Uh, when you do vacuum, uh, make sure that the vacuum bag, if it doesn't have a bag, the contents in that um, vacuum are disposed of uh, into a plastic bag, tie it shut, and then you know, throw it out in the trash. Um, because if you don't empty it, you run the risk of them actually hatching in there and making their way out and um, kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, any pets that are in the house really should 
be treated by a veterinarian um, or at least seek, you know, have the homeowner seek advice on, you know, doing a treatment to that pet as well. Uh, because if you don't, you run the risk of them just bringing the infestations back and forth, back in, you know, after you've done your treatment. So a little bit of homeowner cooperation there is key. Um, the treatment itself, you know, a, a good adult aside, uh, one that is labeled for broadcast of interior surfaces. So things like carpet and furniture, um, you know, there's not a, not a whole bunch of products out there that you can do that with. Uh, there are several though uh, that you can do it. So just make sure your label does allow for that interior broadcast treatment. Um, that'll allow you to treat a much broader uh, portion of that interior um, and get better, uh, better overall control. Uh, IGRs are really important. Um, they help to stop those immature stages from developing into adults. And again, really the adult flea is the key here. That's the one that's biting. That's the one that can transmit disease. So really that's the one we're, we're going to be keyed in on. So a good adult aside and, and an IGR together um, leads to a really good treatment program. Um, you know, there are products that do allow for just spot treatment indoors. Um, I, again, I would think that if, if there's a lot of carpet, uh, you want to do more of a broadcast, so make sure you use an appropriate product. Um, there are aerosols available uh, for ticks on surfaces. Uh, this is one of ours, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, you don't want to spray the pets directly for sure. Uh, you can do the bedding, uh, the, the pet bedding, things like that. Um, you know, another good one is something called a Precord 2000. Uh, it has an adult aside and an IGR in it, so really good. You can do more of a broadcast with a product like that. So for exterior, um, you know, removing debris, um, so sweeping off porches, you know, if there's any, you know, debris there, especially if they have, you know, you know, dogs, cats, you know, they're always shedding hair. Uh, that hair in the cracks and crevices of things like porches and decks and steps are, you um, areas where fleas will, uh, the larva can develop. So again, a good cleaning on some of those outdoor surfaces, uh, the lawn. So a lot of times you don't think about the lawn itself, but it should be mowed uh, prior to treatment. Um, opens up the areas beneath to sunlight, uh, which fleas don't like the direct sunlight. So they won't want to breathe in those areas. Also helps managing uh, thatch as well. So if you can remove some of that thatch layer, um, or if they mow, collect those clippings and dispose of them, um, that's gonna help a little bit with any kind of outdoor infestations uh, as well. Uh, any pet bedding in the yard, you know, sometimes there's areas, you know, pets like to lay down. Sometimes there's an old blanket out there, or you have a dog house or something like that. Um, remove those, launder them as well. Uh, if they're just in bad condition, maybe just dispose of it. Um, but then exclude other wild animals from entering the yard. So whether that's you know maybe having to put up a fence, uh, maybe there's other things, there's some repellents you can put out for uh, certain wild animals, but keeping those uh, limited uh, is going to help limit them bringing fleas back into the the area as well. So again, lawn and perimeter areas, you know you can you can treat those areas uh, with a appropriate labeled uh, adulticide, um, flea larva like shaded areas. So um, areas that are shaded, frequented by pets or other animals are, are key areas. You can use granular products. You can use liquid products in there. Um, sometimes a surfactant mixed in with that can help you know, move that down to those thatch areas. And sometimes watering it in as well, we'll get those products down into the thatch where uh, those pests are uh, residing. So adult fleas, again, here's some, some options for you. You know, there's plenty of other options as well. Um, talked about the surfactant, uh, but we have a couple of things, you know, tall star, triple crown, things like that uh, can work well. An IGR also on the exterior is uh, maybe appropriate. You know, something like uh, uh, Nygaard uh, can be used out there as well. So that'll help uh, reduce the number of uh, larvae that turn into adults. So Moving, moving forward to uh, ticks. So uh, there are some primary tick species here, you know, the American dog tick, your, your brown dog tick, uh, Gulf Coast, Lone Star, and your black-legged tick. Um, so these are some of the ones we're going to talk about here today. Um, yeah, not in really any particular order, but um, 
you know, there are some I think that are more important than others. So we'll, we'll get into that. Um, there's really a couple different types of ticks. You know, we're not going to talk about the soft ticks today, but uh, mainly just the hard ticks. But there are some some soft soft ticks out there that you may come across. Um, you know, and you kind of you know, manage those as you, as you do come across, but not not very often in, in most areas. So this kind of gives you just a quick um, look at some of these tick species, um, some of their descriptions, some of the hosts that they have, the habitats that they like, um, and then some of the health concerns. And really with these, most of the life cycles are pretty similar. Um, some are a little bit different, but um, the health concerns. So these are public health pests as well. Um, you can see to the far right, you know, there's things uh, like Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, there's, you know, alpha gall, which is bad Lyme disease, which is, can be very debilitating, uh, tick-borne relapsing fever. So there are some very, very important health concerns with these, with ticks in general. Um, I think most ticks, you know, have a very similar, you know, size, shape, things like that. So we kind of know them. I think when we see them, uh, some of the immature stages are really, really small. Uh, and then there's also, I said, maybe hard to see. Um, there's also other host animals that, you know, reducing some of those uh, can also help reduce some of their, some of the tick populations in a yard. Um, but we'll go, we'll start with brown dog ticks. So you kind of have the pictures here, which gives you a, a view of kind of what they look like, some of the different, uh, you know, stages, um, engorged ticks as well, non-engorged. Uh, but brown dog tick, um, Kind of spherical uh, brown coloration, right? So I, I love some of these names that we give them. Um, they're brown, right? So we call them a brown dog tick. Um, larva, uh, three pairs of legs, uh, box, approximately you know, 0.54 millimeters long, uh, 0.4 milliliters wide. Um, nymphs have four pairs of legs, reddish brown, resemble the adults, but a little bit smaller. Um, adults are reddish brown, basically two to three millimeters. Uh, in length. So again, typical, you know, tick uh, look to them. Um, they do feed between molts. Um, they take that blood meal uh, before each uh, successive life stage. Um, female dog tick can lay up to 7,000 eggs, but average is close to 4,000. So that's a lot of eggs, you know, from, from a single tick. So one can, mean, can lead to many. Um, they lay their eggs, die shortly afterwards. So that's a good thing. But again, all those eggs are there. Uh, they do hatch between six and 21 days, seek out a host, uh, feed for several days, uh, and then leave the host uh, to develop into nymphs. Uh, the nymphs seek out another host, uh, same thing, kind of repeats. Um, you know, while off the host, they are developing into those uh, subsequent life stages. Uh, they'll take refuge in things like cracks, crevices, you know, behind baseboards, you know, inside homes is where uh, this tick likes to be. Uh, along carpet edges, uh, so any kind of cracks or crevices that they get into, which means, you know, if you're doing treatment for this tick, you want to make sure you look at those types of areas. Um, American dog tick. So a little different look here, um, really distinct by these white markings, you know, behind the head, kind of distinguish it from a uh, brown dog tick to American dog tick. Um, you know, dogs are their main host, uh, though they will get on to people and, and other mammals or other hosts as well. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is a disease that they can uh, pass on. Um, Tularemia is another one. Uh, these are uh, bacterium, uh, bacteria-based diseases. Uh, tick paralysis uh, is another disease that they can transmit. So again, pretty important uh, species here. Uh, People don't, you just don't want them in the house or on their pets because they can move to you as well. Um, looking at life cycles again, they're, they're fairly similar in all um, life stages. So they can survive long periods without food. You know, adults, we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but they bite, they feed, they lay thousands of eggs. Uh, eggs hatch from 20 to 60 days. Again, there's some variation in species. Uh, they do feed and molt into uh, the nymphal stage from the larval stage. Um, Nymphs do the same thing. They feed and then molt into their adult stage. So they're constantly you know, back and forth from their host. Again, almost exclusively on dogs for this one. Life cycle, there are three nymph stages, uh, two months overall, two generations per year in the north. It can be up to four generations in the south. Um, 
indoors up to four generations per year. And again, these, these guys are more than happy to be inside. They can't complete that life cycle indoors. Um, can live up to two years without a blood meal, so they can kind of hang out and just, I don't want to say stay dormant, but they can survive quite a while. So again, after feeding uh, for a couple of weeks, uh, the engorged females, do they do drop off those hosts? They can deposit up to 6,500 eggs on the ground or you know, back on the host. So that's a lot, a lot of eggs, um, you know, from one tick. Um, pets can distribute the eggs throughout the environment or throughout, uh, through their movement uh, throughout that environment. So they can be the ones kind of spreading that you know, maybe from room to room inside of home or outdoors as well. Uh, larva, uh, nymphs do resemble uh, poppy seeds. You know, um, they need to engorge uh, by feeding in all stages to grow. Uh, and they can last, uh, that feeding stage can last up to 50 days. So now we're gonna move on to the uh, Gulf Coast tick. Um, probably not one that maybe some of you have seen a whole lot of, um, but they're primarily in the Southeastern United States. Um, there are some populations, you know, throughout other areas, but um, mainly in the uh, southeast along the Gulf, Gulf Coast. They do transmit um, some diseases. Uh, it's a form of uh, spotted fever. Um, it's our uh, parkiri. So, again, health concern here. Um, larva and nymphs do feed on birds and small rodents. Um, adult ticks feed on deer and other wildlife. Um, and again, they have been uh, associated with transmission of uh, our parkeria to humans. Here's kind of their distribution. So again, a little bit more um, focused than some of the others. Uh, Lone Star Tick, um, this one um, really bites at any stage of, of development from larva to adult. Um, you can identify the female by this kind of white mark on its back. So pretty, pretty diagnostic to uh, which one you're looking at. Um, the male has kind of white spots around the outer edge of its back. Kind of see some of those in here. So diseases. So this one has a whole bunch of different diseases that could transmit. Um, I'm not going to read them all, but, you know, you've got things like uh, bourbon virus, um, southern tick-associated rash uh, illness. Um, you also have alpha gall syndrome, which is down here in the last a bullet point. Um, it can be triggered by the bite of a lone star tick. Um, other, stick, other ticks, you know, can potentially do that as well, but this is one that um, if anyone has had it, I did a talk on ticks, gosh, I don't know if it was six or eight months ago um, in person. So I like doing in-person talks. Uh, they're a little bit more back and forth. And I asked the audience, had anybody uh, gotten this? And there were several people that, that came down with it. And this is a it triggers an allergy to uh, to red meats and and other uh, other meats as well. So imagine you know going to your favorite restaurant, you love a good steak, you order a steak, you eat it, and you go into an anaphylactic uh, type reaction, um, and pretty much you're done eating you know steak. Um, so again, it's a pretty could be a pretty serious uh, syndrome, and it definitely affects people's lives and. Uh, you know, things that they can eat that maybe they ate before that now they, they can't. So um, bone star tick can, can do, definitely cause some, some serious uh, illness. Um, again, blood and gorge female falls off the host, can lay up to 5,000 eggs. Uh, I like this picture because it does show kind of what those eggs look like. Um, kind of looks like caviar or something, right? Um, and it's just, there's just thousands of eggs there uh, in, in one uh, little egg mass. Um, They'll put these in leaf litter, some protected areas where, again, temperature, humidity are right, a good little microclimate for them. Um, and you know, areas of high humidity, which we've talked about uh, at the soil level where she puts these are, are really suited for, uh, for survival of those eggs. Um, this is kind of a look at life cycle um, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the tick. Um, you know, it can go into as much as really two years um, here, but basically eggs, you know, hatch into six-legged larva, uh, usually in the fall. Uh, spring, uh, larva attach and feed to small mammals. Uh, again, 
back to the next fall, um, larva molt into nymphs, and then nymphs into adults throughout the summer and back into the winter. So it can be a, a quite a long uh, life cycle here. Um, their peak activity though, usually is between, um, you know, for the nymphs, uh, May through July, um, larva really August through October. So this may be a good way to look at, you know, how do you treat, when do you treat, um, and what's the best time? So some of those peak times are, are really good times to get out there and do your applications uh, for this tick. And I'll say that's kind of similar to some other ticks as well. Uh, we'll see it here with the uh, uh, deer tick. So these are your Lyme disease uh, vector, also known as, you know, black-legged tick. Um, they're about the size of a sesame seed. And basically, um, they do have a barbed mouth and special glue that they can attach onto you with. Um, so they can you know, bite through us, bite through our skin. They feed on deer, they feed on mice, they feed on uh, other hosts as well. Um, Lyme disease is a big deal. Um, do apologize, this map is a little bit outdated. I actually had a newer one, but I, I couldn't find where I put it. So, um, but this is showing you know, Lyme disease um, uh, cases as reported. Um, northeast is really the, the probably the top area for for Lyme disease, um, but other areas of the country, you know, you can definitely see uh, other cases reported as well. Uh, so again, Lyme disease can be very debilitating, um, and uh, if not treated, you know, quickly. So important thing here, uh, nymphs uh, are responsible for really ninety percent of all Lyme disease cases. They come from bites from the nymph stage. So again, when are nymphs most abundant? Uh, June through August. Uh, this is also when people, you know, like in the Northeast, uh, are probably most out and about, right? It's summertime up there. So they're going to get out. They're going to start doing activities outdoors. And then that's when the nymphs are there. That's when they bite. That's when they transmit uh, disease. So Really, you want to focus on really that larva to nymph stage uh, for treatment, you know, throughout the spring and summer. Um, and you can do that with, you know, a variety of different products. So let's see. So these guys, you know, they do get, you know, under shingles, inside cracks in the foundation, behind fencing, you know, under siding, uh, things like that to, to kind of uh, uh, hang out there where it's nice and protected. Um, they do like to get on vegetation as well in the leaf litter. Um, you know, any areas where there's a little bit taller vegetation are good areas to focus on uh, for not only this tick, but other ticks as well. Uh, they do like to climb up, you know, vegetation along the edges of properties, um, around the foundation of the home, along trails, because they know if they get up on that little bit longer vegetation, so up to maybe two to three feet, um, something walks by, if it's a deer, if it's you, uh, whatever that host may be, they're there, they brush on that vegetation, that tick's hanging out there, it latches on, it has a host, they can go ahead and bite and feed. So, um, so those types of areas are important to look at. So, you know, looking at, you know, Lyme disease uh, throughout this uh, tick life cycle, you know, m mice are a reservoir species for Lyme. Um, so, Part of this life cycle involves that tick feeding on a, on a mouse. Um, the larva, you know, they're not hatched with Lyme disease. So if the adult had it, laid those eggs, the egg does not hatch with this Lyme disease uh, already in it. Uh, they must acquire it from a reservoir host uh, when feeding, and that's where your, your mice come in. Um, they can then pass it on to other hosts, such as, you know, humans, um, uh, deer, you know, other other hosts that they may be feeding on. Um, but again, you look at, you know, where these, where the life cycle of the tick and really the life cycle of Lyme disease kind of interact, um, you can see that, you know, the eggs are hatched, those nymphs feed on those smaller mammals, they turn into, um, you know, nymphs in the summer, in the spring, then they start feeding on humans. So they're passing that on throughout this life cycle. So um, they are fairly intertwined, but it is more than just, you know, a new tick hatches out, then it bites you. All of a sudden you've got Lyme disease. 
just doesn't happen that way. They have to actually acquire it from a reservoir host in the environment. So again, reducing some of those other you know, reservoir hosts can help um, limit the possibility of, of them transmitting Lyme disease. So again, here's your larva. Again, not hatched with Lyme. They must acquire it and pass it on. Um, your engorged nymphs, 25% uh, or so are Lyme disease carriers. Uh, they are the size of basically a poppy seed, so very, very small. And really, this is the stage that does transmit to man. The adults, you know, not, not so much. Um, it's really that nymph stage that is the one that's responsible. And if you look at, you know, their, their seasonal activity, um, you look at where you want to focus treatment, and it's really in here where your nymphs are, are really most active, you know, also reducing, obviously the adult population is important and the larval population, so they don't develop in the nymphs is, is also key. So really in that June, July, August timing is really when there's most, uh, when they're most active. Um, and really that's where if you focus on treatment, you can impact the, um, the potential for transmitting Lyme disease. You know, I'll say, you know, be careful in what you say to your, your customers. You know, you don't want to say, well, if we treat, you're not going to get Lyme disease. You know, that those kind of statements are, you know, uh, not responsible for one. Uh, and you're going to get yourself into trouble, uh, number two, if you, you start to make those kind of promises. Now, same thing with, with, with a mosquito treatment. You wouldn't say, yeah, we're going to treat, you're never going to get bit. Uh, it just, it's not possible and it's really not, not reality, I guess. So some signs of Lyme disease, um, you know, has a lot of signs and symptoms. Um, problem is not everybody experiences all of these signs or symptoms. Um, if early key symptoms are missed, um, what was once a mild potential uh, disease may go unnoticed for many years until it becomes very serious and really a, a debilitating disease over time. So early signs, you know, headaches, you know, swelling and pain of the joints, flu-like symptoms, and this kind of bullseye rash. Um, you know, it's great to say, hey, if you got bit by a by a deer tick, if you don't get that rash, you're fine. That's not the case though, because about 20 to 40 percent of people bitten and infected uh, will not show this uh, this type of a rash. So um, I would say if you were bit by a deer tick, you, you know it's a deer tick. Um, maybe go see, have that client, or if it's yourself, go see a doctor, you know, maybe do some other testing. There are some tests they can do for Lyme disease. Um, years ago, I don't think they were, I won't say they weren't super reliable, but they were not as reliable maybe as some new testing today. Um, but you definitely want to go and get yourself checked out. Um, I think starting on a course of antibi antibiotics early is something that they may prescribe. But again, that's up to your doctor uh, to figure out. But it could be something that could save you from, you know, a, a more serious illness down the road. But talk to your doctor on it. You know, if you got bit by the tick, if you can save the tick, take it with you so you can say, hey, this is the one that bit me. And, you know, they can at least identify, yes, it's a deer tick or, or no. Um, and then maybe start a proper course of action. So really important to, again, get started early on that, you know, again, if customers are getting bit, make sure they do seek, you know, some medical advice. Um, and again, we're not doctors, so we can't say, oh yeah, go take an antibiotic or do this or do that. Um, that's not our call. We don't know their health background. So don't ever do that. Just say, hey, maybe you want to go see your doctor and say, yeah, I got bit by this deer tick a week ago, two days ago, whatever it was, and get their advice. So, you know, looking at, you know, ticks and, and, you know, possible, you know, treatments and things like that. Identify areas where pests may enter, you know, look around the foundation, look for those cracks and crevices, um, you know, in the foundation, you know, in brick and, and veneer, or wood siding, um, areas that they can maybe sneak under there, get in. Uh, again, not so different than just perimeter pest control, you know, especially around the home. Um, you know, make sure entry points get sealed up, you know, and, and, uh, you know, don't allow as many pests to get in. Um, potential breeding areas or conducive areas. So look for those pet, you know, feeding and resting areas. We've talked about this with some of the others, um, but, you know, things like under 
porches and decks, look for areas where, you know, other hosts may be. So we talked about, you know, mice and things like that. Um, are they making trails along the foundation? You know, are there other um, wild animals in those areas as well? Do you, do you have, you know, problems with raccoons coming in or, or um, you know, squirrels, things like that, um, and try to exclude those. Uh, look for shady areas of the lawn. Uh, so again, they like those shady, higher humidity, higher temp areas, you know, places where you store, store wood or other debris in the yard. Um, lawn grass and shrubs should be cut down. Rodent burrows, again, if you have those, uh, very possible they could be uh, hosts for those ticks as well. So work with the homeowner uh, to take some corrective action. Um, again, get those entry points sealed up, uh, eliminated those limiting conducive areas and conducive, conducive conditions, pick up debris, keep the lawn mowed and, and make sure thatch is managed uh, accordingly, uh, trim the shrubs, um, and then you know proper application of uh, a treatment is uh, also something that uh, needs to be done. Um, but make surroundings unattractive to ticks. So if you have you know, lots of vegetation like this, here's a trail going in here, um, trim those things back, um, you know, make a clear path. Uh, you know, some people have you know, larger yards, they like to walk you know, in their you know, back wooded areas, you know, uh, make sure that they are trimmed uh, back to reduce the potential for ticks getting onto you. Um, you know, widen pathways. Uh, reduce clutter and leaf litter around the home. These are all areas that are conducive. You, know, you saw the picture of the tick laying those eggs. That's where they're going to lay them. You know, areas with that higher moisture content, uh, higher relative humidity, and uh, shaded and protected from that direct sunlight and direct heat. Um, if you do things like this, maybe you can reduce possibility of ticks, you know, 40% or so. Um, you know, doing a barrier treatment with insecticides, uh, again, to areas where these ticks may be hanging out. So again, those higher vegetation areas along edges, so along the edge of the yard, uh, low-hanging branches, uh, perimeter uh, areas adjacent to you know forested areas. So if you have a lawn that has you know a wooded area behind it, maybe hit some of those areas uh, you know adjacent to that uh, more that higher vegetation area. Um, you know, always, you know, follow your label directions, you know, make sure you can treat those areas, um, you know, that you do have that more broadcast application ability with the products. Um, again, this can lead to, you know, maybe a 60 to 90% reduction <clears throat> in ticks. Um, so preventative applications, maybe May through June, you know, treat lawns, uh, areas that border the woods and trails. We talked about those. Not going to get much in the products here, but, you know, there are many, many products out there that you can use um, from granular insecticides to liquids. Um, what I'll say about that is granular insecticides are good for getting a nice residual down in the thatch, uh, maybe into mulch areas around a property, but you're probably still gonna have to do some kind of a liquid um, to that little bit higher vegetation, which the ticks may climb up on uh, and then wait for that host to pass. So gets a little bit better coverage on some of that taller vegetation with a, a liquid application. Biological controls, um, got to put one of these in here. Um, you know, uh, guinea hens are good. You know, they can reduce ticks and other insect populations, but probably not for everybody. Um, you need several uh, to really impact the population. They are noisy um, and they can escape, right? So if you don't have a good confinement uh, reduction, you know, they can definitely do a decent job in certain areas, but um, you know, not recommended for everybody, but it is one of those you know, biological or, or IPM approaches. Um, there are other things, you know, uh, years ago, I haven't seen them a whole lot lately called tick tubes where you can attract ticks into these cardboard tubes um, to, uh, to help dispose of them. Uh, there are, you know, IGRs, again, you can use out outdoors as well. Um, they typically don't last as long outdoors, the IGRs, but again, there are some, you know, that you can use out there. Uh, just look at the labels and uh, see which ones are labeled for outdoor use. Um, so indoor, you know, for ticks, you know, have the pets at least evaluated or, or treated by a veterinarian. Um, remove and replace bedding, you know, laundered on high heat. So not very different than you know, what you would do for fleas. Um, 
crack and crevice treatments on the inside. Again, I don't want to get a lot into the products uh, today, but um, really crack and crevice treatments are, are probably the, the key here. So hit areas where maybe they're going to lay eggs, especially if you're dealing with dog ticks. Um, you know, vacuum some of those areas out as well. So vacuum is really important here also. Uh, and then remember to um, dispose of that vacuum bag once you do that, uh, because again, you don't want to just have them hanging out in the vacuum bag where they can escape out later on. Um, so again, work safely, you know, wear appropriate uh, protective uh, gear as, as per the label. Um, I always like to say uh, labels have certain PPE on them, um, you know, gloves, maybe a respirator if you're working in a confined space, um, shoes, socks, you know, things like that. But you can always go more than that. You don't have to just say, well, it's a, the label says all I have to do is wear gloves and a long sleeve shirt. That's what I'm going to do. You can always go a little bit over, you know, than what the label does recommend. You can't do less. You can always do more. Uh, again, always follow those label directions and label instructions, uh, especially when doing any kind of broadcast indoors. Um, I take a lot of phone calls from folks that have bought our products. Uh, I'll say, unfortunately or fortunately, sometimes I get calls from homeowners that have products and they just want to broadcast everything inside the house. And you have to remind them that, hey, we can't do that. <laughs> uh, the labels usually don't allow for that kind of a treatment, um, you know, for the most part. But again, there are some good products out there that you can uh, do those those uh, broad, more broadcast treatments. So make sure you do know what label, what the label does allow for those types of treatments. Uh, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to the, the manufacturer of a product. Uh, this is our, our 800 number. You can always ask us questions. Can I do this? Can I not do this? Um, or if you have a question on the label or, you know, use sites, things like that, uh, we're here to answer those questions for you. Um, all the other manufacturers have hotlines as well. If you don't know, just call and ask. Most times they are staffed with pretty knowledgeable folks uh, that can help you through that. So, um, yeah, so that's the last slide. All right. Thanks. Thank all. you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you.